Hey, thanks for checking out this DM tips video for Vecna running up that hill. This is inspired by the adventure Don't Say Vecna, a level 20 adventure written by Michael Galvis and Mike Bernay from D&D Beyond and by the maps of Heroic Maps. And of course, thanks to Stranger Things for making Vecna so cool again and Kate Bush for her cool song Running Up That Hill, which inspired part of this adventure for me. There will be spoilers abounding here, so if you're a player, Please play the adventure first and then come back and check on the videos after that. Okay, so I ran this for level 16 characters and it's written for level 20 characters. So I'll, dis I'll discuss some of the differences in how I would run it between the two different levels while I'm going through the details here. For pacing, you're gonna wanna do character introductions and get through the entry of the adventure in about the first hour. The second hour, you wanna do the living quarters, the library, the garden, if you can. The third hour, the lab and the observatory and you'd really like to get into the um, sanctuary in Don't Say Back No or Running Up That Hill the way I ran it before the final hour because it's going to take a good solid hour if not more to run that part. So for pacing you might need to speed up exploration a little bit you know help players along saying that, hey you searched everything here and there's these items of interest and you do your normal checks on the door and there's no traps things like that to get them Moving forward, if they're falling behind a little bit on that pacing. For music, I used the Defiled, Defiled Temple by Tabletop Audio. Let's look at that real quick. Defiled Temple, I'll turn it up for us. Real good uh, atmospheric music. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the Diablo-esque feel to it, too. Just ran that in the background while I ran it. Now let's look at the maps. So the maps I took were from heroic maps and the primary map is called Lich's Lair. Let me pull up Lich's Lair in full. You'll get an idea how much I changed it for running this adventure. Okay here I have the full Lich's Lair map in all its grandeur. Just a gorgeous map made by heroic maps and when I move this to the back you'll see I cut out the southeastern chunk of it. Cut out a little bit of this uh, middle part right here. But the rest I used. And I tweaked a little bit. I, you know, covered the door openings. Using Photoshop, covered the stairs here. Added a portal right there. Changed the head of the skeleton to be missing. Match the adventure. So if I set that to the back. Or actually, delete that. There we go. Now you see what it looks like after I've modified it. That's Lich's Lair. I also used a map called Explorer haunted places and there's a forest section I use that for the garden here and then they have a map called sanctuary of the fallen I use that for the running up that hill part so the adventure starts uh, as the party approaches a tower in limbo and I changed this to the party's looking for a um, tower or dwelling of a group of sages that have disappeared but there's rumors that they Sometimes doorways into their old abode appear. People go in and never return, though. So you can put this in any city you want, any big city you want. Uh, Greyhawk, Waterdeep. I did Greyhawk, since if they're searching for scholars on Vecna, that's a great place to put it. The adventure says, you know, anytime they say the name Vecna, there's a curse. So I put a little reminder to myself here. This text in white is on the GM layer in Roll20, so the players don't see that. So in this first room, I took... Uh, the doors that were here, and I copied them up to here, and I made the stairs, I reversed the stairs, so they go from down to up to the doors. So I started the party out in a back alley of the city of Greyhawk, and they found this dark flight of steps that led up to doorway, um, encircled and covered by black tentacles. So of course they had to go check that out, and that was the front doors into the tower. They arrive into the first room of the tower, and that room has this darkness area, so using Fog of War in Roll20, I would do a darkness like this, and you can kind of do like a jagged edge to it, just to give it a little more, more menacing of a feel. And you have the devil in there, uh, waiting to attack the party as they approach the door that they can inexplicably see through the darkness they can't see, but it's illuminated the door on the far side. Now a party of level 16 or 20 could have true sight, and so they might see right through it and see the devil. And or, and if they do, you might want to think about moving the devil back around the corner here so it can attack them once they step into the room with them not knowing he's there. 
Either way, the Devil's are pretty much a pushover for this level party, 16 or 20. But that just makes them feel more powerful, more strong. And it'll be a good counterpoint to when they feel um, despair when they're fighting Vecna and his overwhelming power. All right, so then from there, we have this long hallway, the statue at the end. I decided to make that a statue of Cass, the Bloody Handed. Give it a Wicked Sword, a Wolf's Head Helmet. Um, I like to throw magic items in, I think about to the rate of about one an item, one hour, one item per hour permanent and one item per hour um, consumable. So I put adamantine plate here on the statue of Cass. Then we get into the living quarters, which is the second level of the adventure Don't Say Vecna. And I have a place for Bryn, a place for Kaylin and Aiden. Various statues here. Again, this is all in the GM layer, so players don't see this. I made one of Aiden, one of Kaylin, one of Bryn, and then one of Vecna. But Vecna in his original human form. So the party might not know that it's Vecna. The storage that the party might see in the bottom level of the tower if they dispel the darkness back here, instead I put in the storage room that's here. And then for sprinkling through some more magic items, Pearl of Power and all the slipperiness here in the bedroom. And yeah, that's the second level. So then the library level, actually, um, yeah, the library level. So up to the library, uh, which is I think still on the, first, or the second level of the original adventure. But this is a great Lich's Library, but also a great Sage's Library. So this dungeon, you know, it's Lich's Lair is what it's called, but it worked great for a Sage's Lair that had been, like, become overwhelmed by the evil pouring out of the Dark Gate that they found. And the spiders fit the theme of Vecna. I thought about putting some spiders in this adventure, maybe like in the garden section, and that might be something I might do if I ran that again. But let's get back to the library. So in the library, there's this book, and what a great place to put an illusionary book of vile darkness. And I made it do all the things the book of vile darkness does as regard to harming individuals. And there's even one member of the party that was very tied to nature, and the book of vile darkness destroys nature. And so I had it doing more to them. And finally, when they could see it with true seeing, they saw it was an illusion. The door to the garden I put right next to it, and that's fitting that the book you know, makes the garden dead because that's what it does with natural stuff. So here is the garden. Here's the scarred tree. Um, again, not a very tough fight for this level of characters, but it just makes them feel more powerful. Another counterpoint. I put a stone of controlling earth elementals and the erupting earth that came up when the ghouls poured out. All right. Then from the library, we come to the laboratory. Here you have the masses of flesh on the ceiling, which is Bryn and his consumption of the other sages. The head I marked with this icon of the head. I took the head off of the skeleton on the original map to better fit the description of that area in Don't Say Vecna. Uh, speaking of Don't Say Vecna, I don't know if I caught it every time the players said it, but they did say at least one time, and from then on they called him the Whispered One. And, you know, they take the damage in the adventure for saying it and struck a player mute for 10 minutes or seven minutes. Okay, these are shambling mounds. Um, and I originally used the shambling mound token, and I should have, in retrospect, used a more flashy token like uh, Jibbering Mouther, and then just assigned it the shambling mound stat block, which is what I will do if I run it again. And as these things died, I just kind of had them kind of like come together and move the head to whichever, you know, remained if I if the one with the head on it was destroyed. And then I put in a potion of greater healing and a potion of stone giant strength here in the area of all this uh, laboratory stuff. Then we come to the observatory. So here in the observatory in Don't Say Vecna, it has tentacles that attack someone wounded. Um, you could keep that, or you could, another thing you could possibly do is this um, writing on the floor. So. Right on the floor, be prepared. The players are going to want to know what it says. And I wasn't really thinking about it when I ran it. But, you know, think of something in Infernal that it might say about Vecna. And this, I would have it indicate that one of these locations, one of these circles, a hand goes in, one an eye goes in, and one a head goes in. And then rather than the tentacles on the floor, you could have it so if a person steps in a circle, it like rips off their eye and puts it into the door. Or rips off their hand and puts it into the door or their head, but of course that would be death to the player. So maybe give a save for that, or 
hopefully have the other ones happen first so they know what might happen if they try it. <clears throat> and then I would put these pools here as like being original sage pools and the writing all obscured on those. So now we have the black gate and then when the party opens the black gate, they have this processional hall that climbs. This is where they're running up that hill part. And this worked great. I had Vecna right here in this very first chamber. And in the spot where it would take them uh, more than 30 feet of move to get to him. So most of the party would have to dash to get to him. And of course, Vecna's attacks. Um, when I run these big monsters or all monsters, I like to up their damage to make it just that more, I guess, uh, uh, dangerous and that much more suspenseful for the players. So if I was doing level 20, I'd be having Vecna do about 1.8 times damage. When I did level 16, I had him do 1.5 times damage. I did not run Legend or Lair Actions, um, nor the Book of Vile Darkness at level 16. Level 20, I want to bring those two things in. Also at level 20, I think 272 hit points is too little. I've, I've run some level 20 parties that go through that and less than a round. So uh, consider up in hit points and definitely use the Lair Actions at level 20. Now, I changed one of his abilities, which in retrospect was really powerful, and that was his Vile Teleport. Normally, his Vile Teleport is when he arrives at the destination it does damage. I made it so he could do it when he arrives or leaves. Well, that played perfectly for running up that hill, because he would just keep backing up, keep damaging the party. The party kept having to run up to him. You can go watch the play video and see how that went. And he's doing damage all this whole time. I would say, and of course, he heals 80 points, which is really disheartening. I would say if you're going to do that where you can do damage when he leaves the spot to give that a saving throw. There. And you could even tie how much damage he regains to how many people he injures too. Something you can think about. So with the 1.8 multiplier factor, he does enormous amounts of damage. The Flight of the Damned, it doesn't do enormous because it's a big huge area. But the Rotted Fate, 175 points of Necro. You might think, oh god, that's unlivable. Well, this party had a couple of necro-resistant characters, and of course they can make the 22 con save quite often, so they did really well. Um, they survived that rotten fate quite a few times. Maybe the more dangerous thing is his dagger, Afterthought, because when he hits with a dagger, you cannot heal, and you don't even get a save against the not healing party until your next turn. So if you're going down, you can be really hard to get back up after he's hit you with Afterthought. Now the party, Conversely, is going to get half hit points back when they're in here. You have to watch out for the walls. I think I missed that once or twice. That's an easy thing to miss as you're running this. Forbiddance, I didn't really do anything there, but no one else really brought in like a celestial uh, summons or anything like that. So that didn't come into play. I did the pulse of the door dispelling, although that can feel kind of gotcha to players. Um, and if I was going to full bore on Vecna where he had like 500 hit points and 1.8 times damage and using lair actions and using the Book of Vile Darkness, then I wouldn't feel bad about doing... No, I would feel bad about doing that, because the party's going to need to survive something like that. Death Ward's going, and AIDS going, and things like that. And if they all come down, I'll be hurt. So, um, for me, it only really affected a couple of fly spells, so I didn't feel too bad. Plus, the fly spells would counteract running up that hill quite a bit, so I didn't feel bad about doing that. The flames. So when they open that gate, the flames erupt. And for the flames, I used, um, Roll20 has like a marketplace, and Kristen Carlson has a thing called Toasted Thaumaturgy, which I grabbed a 40-foot fireball from that, and I turned it blue in Photoshop. So then when they, <clears throat> when they opened that gate, I had the flames starting here and moving six squares, 30 feet every round, just pushing them up that hill. So they're having to get up this hill, and overcome the difficult terrain of the stairs and overcome getting, you know, Vecna teleporting away from them over and over. So it's a great fight. And then it ends up in the well of bones here at the end. And Vecna's like, you know, I will add your bones to this well if he's going to kill him. But they defeated him when I ran it here, in the final room. I think the lifesaver for them was a chill touch spell. So Vecna has resistance to Necro, but he'll still take a chill touch. And then that will mean his Vile Teleport, which lets him regain hit points, doesn't work. And that was the, the, 
the game changer for the party there. It's tough to do because very often he's going to use a reaction to stop a chill touch. But they were getting good by the end of the fight at knowing, you know, use up his reactions and then hit him with the spell you need to hit him with. And that worked great. All right. That is the adventure. I like to throw in the match cams. Again, I have the potion of cloud giant strength here at the end. Figurine of wondrous power, obsidian steed. You could call that Cass's steed if you want. And the final treasure split for the party, of course. Um, one person took the Book of Our Darkness and the Steed. So they were the new rider on the black horse in this world. And that was the adventure. I hope you have a great time running this adventure. It's a lot of fun. If you have any questions, throw them in the comments below. And also I'd like to love to hear how it goes for you. Thank you very much.